Zoom link. Thank you. So in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and get started. So I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining today's Money Files to Person National Quarterly Call. We have some very uh, important information and uh, demonstrations to share with you today regarding the new uh, MDCT Med Medicaid data collection tool. Um, and we have our partners with Coforma and Mathematica here today to uh, share these presentations. So I want to thank them in advance for uh, taking the time out to um, do the presentations today. Uh, the meeting appointment did include the slides from today's presentation. However, I'm going to add them to the chat momentarily. Um, I want to quickly turn things over to our leader, Jennifer Bowden, with the Division of Community Systems Transformation. She's the director. I would like to turn it over to Jen for a quick welcome and some important CMS updates. Thanks, Alicia. Hi, everyone. It's, it's nice to see you all. Um, it's great to see so many people on the call today. So uh, welcome to the National Quarterly Call. Um, so I'm Jen Bowden. I'm the director of the Division of Community Systems Transformation. So um, you might be aware that we've had a really, really, just really busy couple of weeks here at CMS. So um, we've had a lot going on and a lot of really important announcements and releases. And so I just wanted to uh, highlight a, a few things that have gone out over the past couple of weeks. Um, so two weeks ago, we released two guidance documents. The first was an informational bulletin updating the HCBS quality measure set that had been originally released in 2022. We uh, did a refresh of that measure set um, and in, importantly added uh, some companion fee-for-service measures to it, uh, to the measure set. Um, those We had some existing managed LTSS measures, and so we've incorporated the fee-for-service versions in that, and so that was a really exciting uh, update to it. Um, there were some other changes in it, and so I would encourage you all to take a look at that informational bulletin if you haven't already. Um, the, the other uh, informational bulletin we released was uh, the one that I think many of you had been waiting for. Um, so this is the informational bulletin that described the HCBS quality measure set reporting requirements for MFP grant recipients. And we'll talk uh, more about that on the call today. And again, if you haven't had a chance to uh, read that informational bulletin, would really encourage you all to take a look at it. And then at the same time as we release those informational bulletins, we also released the 2024 Long-Term Services and Supports Quality Measures Technical Specifications and Resource Manual. It's a bit of a mouthful, but those technical specifications um, uh, are essentially, those are the technical specifications mm -hmm. for a, a lot of the, the measures in the measure in the HCBS quality measure set for which CMS is the measure steward. Um, that uh, technical, that update to the technical specifications um, includes a lot of the details on those corresponding fee-for-service measures that I had mentioned that we added uh, to the measure set. And so when, with the, the inclusion of those um, for eight of those, uh, there are eight managed LTSS measures in that, uh, that resource manual. Seven of those now have corresponding fee-for-service measures. And then we've also incorporated those into the HCBS quality measure set. So you have a question, if you have any questions about those um, changes, um, we do have a number of resources available uh, in to provide technical assistance related to quality. And you can, of course, always reach out to the MFP demo mailbox and to your CMS project officer. Um, uh, in terms of announcements, we also had a really busy uh, uh, week. Uh, it will start to the week since it's not over yet. But um, so this past week on Monday, we issued three final rules. Um, so the Ensuring Access to Medicaid Services final rule, this is uh, commonly referred to as the access rule. The Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program Managed Care Access fin Finance and Quality final rule, that is commonly referred to as the managed care rule. And then the minimum staffing standards for long-term care facilities and Medicaid institutional payment transparency reporting final rule. Sorry, the, we have very long names, but uh, you can we you know commonly refer to that one as the minimum staffing rule. 
So the access and managed care rules really go together and in combination, the advanced access and quality of care and improved health outcomes across fee-for-service and managed care delivery systems. And the minimum staffing rule sets for the first time national minimum staffing requirements for nursing homes and also requires that states report on the percentage of Medicaid payments for certain institutional services that is spent on compensation for direct care workers and support staff. And specifically, those uh, reporting provisions in the uh, the minimum staffing rule applies specifically to nursing facility services and services in intermediate care facilities for individuals with intellectual disabilities. So uh, there's a lot in those rules. Um, on the, we'll be doing a number of uh, calls and open door forums. I did want to call attention to a couple things in the access rule in particular, which I'll get to in just a second. But I also want to note that if you'd like to know more about the access rule. In particular, um, we will be discussing that on the CMCS all state call on Tuesday, and then the managed care rule will be uh, will also be discussed on an upcoming call, uh, call, but the one on Tuesday will cover the access rule um, in particular. So uh, just one note on the, the access rule. Um, so the access rule for folks who are not familiar, familiar with it has three different sections one of which is focused on home and community-based services. And in this section of the rule, we are essentially establishing a new strategy for oversight, monitoring, quality assurance, and quality improvement for Medicaid and HCBS programs. I'm not going to talk about all the provisions in the access rule. You can definitely hear about that on the all-state call, as well as uh, lots of other calls and webinars we'll be having on the rule. But I did want you to be aware that the access rule includes new requirements for all states to report on the HCBS quality measure set. So we are now requiring all states to report every other year beginning in 2028 on the HCBS quality measure set, and we are phasing in over eight years requirements for states to stratify their data by demographic and other factors. And so that that's so that we in states can really use this data to assess disparities in HCBS programs. And to promote consistency across Medicaid HCBS authorities, those quality measure set reporting requirements apply to HCBS under sections 1915C, I, J, and K authorities, and to section 1115 demonstrations that include HCBS, and they apply regardless of whether the services are delivered under fee-for-service or managed care. And then we will, for awareness, we will be establishing a process um, that provides opportunities for public comment. And this will include opportunities for comment through the Federal Register. Um, and we're, we'll use those to establish and maintain the, the measure set. Um, and we'll be doing that on an every other year basis. We will be issuing guidance. So lots more information will be coming on those new requirements in the access rule, including those related to the HCBS quality measure set. In the meantime, though, I just want to know uh, for this group, because I know the measure set has been a, a hot topic of conversation, um, that we did, we have tried very, very hard to align the HCBS quality measure set reporting requirements in the access rule with the HCBS quality measure set requirements for MFP grant recipients. Um, if you have concerns, if you have questions about this, please reach out to your CMS project officer or, you know, submit a question to the MFP demo mailbox, and we're happy to work with you on any questions or concerns that you have. Um, so those are uh, some of the highlights of uh, some of our recent releases, and I'm now going to turn the call over to Jessica Ross. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jessica Ross from Mathematica, and as Alicia mentioned during most of today's call, um, oh, sorry, next slide, please. There we go. Most of today's call, we're going to talk about the formal launch of the new MFP reporting templates and the Medicaid data collection tool online application, which my colleague Christine Fulton and Natalie Carney from CoForma will speak to. But before we get to that, we wanted to take this time to gather your input as the CMS team is beginning to think about the MFP intensive at this year's HCBS conference, which will be here sooner than we know it. Um, okay, so we are going to run a brief mentee poll in the next few minutes. And basically, 
We're looking to gather your input about topics you'd like to hear about during the MFP intensive, and also which topics you might like to hear about or talk with about with your peers, either in the format of a panel discussion or in a small group breakout session. And finally, we'll also ask for other suggestions or preferences you have for engaging with your peers during the intensive in some other way or any other general feedback you have for the team planning the intensive. Next slide. All right, um, so going to the mentee poll as shown on this slide, we would ask you to navigate to www.menti.com and enter the code 25342966, and that will start the poll. We'll also put that number in the chat right now and put a direct link to the Menti poll in the chat. Um, so hopefully folks are able to jump over to the chat and get those links. If you have any challenges accessing the mentee poll, uh, please just chat either myself or Stephen Young and we will help you troubleshoot that. And also you can always send us feedback outside of the poll. All right, um, I think at this point, let's stop sharing the slides and flip over to the poll if that's possible. All right. Okay. Um, looks like people are answering already, which is great. So for this first question, CMS identified some potential topics to talk about at the MFP intensive. And we're interested to know if these are the topics you'd like to hear about. Multiple selections are allowed. So really this is just a pulse check about, you know, whether these topics listed are of interest to the group and really what which, which topics are rising to the top. And I see looking at the results, we've got a lot of votes for the HCBS quality measures, no, no surprise. Um, also, it looks like monitoring and achieving MFP reporting consistency across TMSIS, the semi-annual progress reports and supplemental budgets is one that is attracting attention, which is great. And looks like in third place, we have the impact of the expanded definition for MFP supplemental services. All right, um, I see a lot of votes here. I will give it another few minutes to see if this distribution changes, but really appreciate everyone everyone voting here. All right. Okay, it looks like our top contenders have remained pretty consistent here. So with that, let's move on to the next question. Okay, so that set of topics was the set that we thought about together with CMS that might be of interest to you, but realizing we might have not have captured everything that would be of interest. This is an open question to ask you if there's anything else you would like to hear about during the intensive that wasn't covered in those few topics that we put on the board. Rebalancing projects. How are others doing with completing the operational protocol? Great, great comments. OP and work planned. I don't know what they're talking about. Innovative housing partnerships. Work plan. OK, I'm seeing a lot around the MFP reporting templates, which is great. Employment initiatives. Using data to determine program goals and assess outcomes. Let's see, rebalancing the tribal initiative, barriers to transition. Oh, these are great. Thank you guys so much. 
Oh, I like this one. MDS as a tool for identifying potential transitions, rebalancing, a lot of votes for rebalancing. Let's see. Give it another minute. And just because we move on in the presentation, that doesn't mean the poll is closed. So anything you put in here will be captured. Uh, I'm seeing a couple comments about submitting the budgets and increasing transitions for target populations. Okay, these are a lot of great ideas here. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I think, love all these all these comments that are still coming in. I'm going to move us on in the poll just because we only have a limited time together today. But as I said, just know that if you enter more suggestions, they will be recorded and we will bring those back to the CMS team. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to pivot to asking about how you might like to interact with your peers at the intensive. We thought of two options for peer engagement. The first would be asking, say, a panel of maybe three or five of you to speak on a topic with an opportunity for Q&A. So the question here is, which topics do you think would work well for that kind of format? All right, um, I'm seeing some votes for the impact of the expanded supplemental services definition, the safe and effective nursing facility discharges, HCBS quality measures. I think that's gonna be a popular one today. <laughs> um, all right, lots of votes actually coming in for the supplemental services. All right. I think we have two in the lead here, the HCBS quality measures and the supplemental services so far. All right, I think we should move on to the next poll question. Again, just because we're moving on, the poll will not be closed, so your information will still be recorded. Okay, um, this question is, is asking the same type of question about whether you would like any, um, like to tackle those topics in small group breakouts. And this would be, you know, where you got to chat directly in peer groups of maybe, you know, 12 to 15 people about a certain topic. So the question is, which topics do you think would be best for that kind of format? All right, seeing a lot of votes for the HCBS quality measure implementation and supplemental services is again looking like a popular one. All right. I think we have the same two winners in the in the lead here, <laughs> which is great. Okay, I think we should pivot to the next question. All right, so, so far we've run through two potential options for peer engagement, one being a panel discussion of your peers and the other being small group breakout sessions. This question is asking if there are other ways you'd like to engage with your peers during the intensive that we haven't talked about yet. We know peer engagement is a big bonus of being at the conference in person, so we're open to any ideas you might have about how to make that happen, you know, what kind of formats you think would be good to try. Oh, cocktails. <laughs> I like that response. Okay, um, we used to do a great dinner. All 
All right. Um, I see notes on being paired with other similar states that have a fee for service model, breakout sessions with like states, networking social time. Yeah, a couple, couple comments for knowledge transfer. I love that idea. Paired with states of similar size. Okay. Oh, I like HCBS Jeopardy. <laughs> that sounds really fun. Director outing. Okay. Roundtable discussions where you can move from one table to the next. I like that idea too. Sort of an around the world situation. Uh, second vote for pairing with states of similar size. Okay. Third vote <laughs> I'm seeing now. Tribal initiative states expanding access to services to other MFP states. Organized networking and asking for a contact list. We can take that back. All right, I'm seeing a lot of feedback around being paired with similar states along different dimensions, whether that's you know fee for service versus managed care or size or some other facet of program implementation. Okay. All right. Um, these are all wonderful. Thank you so much for these great ideas. I think we will move us forward to the final poll question. And this is an open-ended question. Is there anything else you'd like to share or suggest to the team planning the MFP intensive this year? Maybe not. Maybe we we set our all our ideas on the other one. Okay. Make sure it's not freezing in the conference room. Okay, noted. Visuals. Friendly reminder that we have territories and states now. Definitely appreciate that comment and and duly noted. Time for the DQAs to meet and network. Updates on funding, including a virtual option. Yep. Uh, more engagement with CMS staff during the conference. Okay. Um, I think we're having a slowdown of responses, but these are great comments and, um, you know, really appreciate the feedback. The poll will stay open after the call. So um, feel free to continue to add your comments. And the questions that we posed are also listed in the slides that were attached to the meeting in case you want to send feedback later. And with that, I, I think we're good on the poll and I will turn the mic back over to Christine Fulton, but really appreciate everyone's feedback. Thanks all. All right, so hello everyone. Good to see many familiar names on the line and good to be here with you all this afternoon. My name is Christine Fulton and I'm a senior managing consultant with Mathematica. And as Alicia mentioned, I'm going to be covering the contents of the work plan during today's presentation. I'll review some key milestones and planning considerations as you all begin to draft the work plan. And you will note that these next three sections cover a lot of ground, so I will spend less time on certain slides, but they're here for you to come back to as needed. So next slide, please. So as a reminder, the work plan is a piece of a comprehensive effort over the last couple years to update, streamline, and modernize the MFP reporting and monitoring processes. Our efforts have focused on developing a standardized template for the operational protocol, 
revisions to the semi-annual progress report and the addition of the work plan to capture new reporting requirements. In addition to those content changes, how MFP recipients report is also changing with the development of the SAR and work plan forms within the Medicaid data collection tool or MDCT portal. And we are excited for you all to see that live de demo later today. Next slide, please. The new and revised templates reflect MFP statutory and regulatory requirements, efforts to standardize questions across reports, and the incorporation of MFP recipient feedback in the process. And as many, if not all of you know, these templates and the MCD, MDCT application have been in the Paperwork Reduction Act or PA, PRA review since October, and we anticipate approval within the next few weeks. Next slide, please. With the rollout of these new MFP reporting templates, the MDCT application and the associated technical assistance support, we've aimed to address the items noted on these slides. We've received feedback that identifying connections between different MFP reporting efforts would be helpful. So I'll start to talk about that some more as I walk through these slides. The TA also aims to consider the sequence of when MFP reporting happens and minimize burden as best we can by adopting the new templates over time. And building on the connections around and across MFP reporting, the TA aims to recognize connections to the HCBS quality measure set reporting requirements as well. Next slide. So with the next three slides, I'll highlight some key dates through the end of the calendar year. This first slide reflects TA efforts that have already happened over the last couple months. So the TA team joined peer group calls in March and April to share some of these key milestones and the upcoming TA plans. We also used those calls to gather your feedback about technical assistance needs and requested areas of focus. Thank you so much for sharing that feedback. It's already been incredibly helpful and we will continue to use it to shape our TA strategy over the coming months. We also introduced the Data Quality Analyst Peer Group to the work plan in early April. It was a preview of this call and folks participated in breakout rooms to discuss where they were with their work plan development and considerations for starting to draft. And this last box, this last box reflects today's national quarterly call and our goals. Next slide, please. So in this slide, the focus is on activities through June. A few items to call out. The middle box announces the planned launch date of MDCT as May 1st, which is next week, if you can believe it. This will open the call for MFP recipients to draft and submit their initial work plan. And as noted here, reporting of the SAR through MDCT is expected to begin in early 2025, reflecting period two of 2024. And then in May and June, technical assistance will continue in various formats. We're planning to hold office hour sessions to support any technical needs you may have as you begin to engage with MDCT as well as webinars to support the content development of the work plan. We're also planning to roll out tip sheets for both, um, to, for preparing both the operational protocol template and the work plan in late March, March, <laughs> late May, with plans to discuss them with you all during those late May, early June peer group calls. Next slide, please. And then looking at July through the end of 2024, time sure does go fast, um, TA support will continue and we're planning to share example responses for both the OP and work plan in late June. The draft work plan is due in MDCT by September 3rd, though recipients can and are encouraged to submit prior to that date. The CMS review and approval process will occur between September and December, with MFP recipient revisions occurring 
in that time slot as needed. And then December 31st represents the due date for both the final work plan and the operational protocol updates using the new template. And similarly for the OP, MFP recipients can and are encouraged to submit prior to that date. Then starting in 2025, we shift our technical assistance focus to the first submission of the SAR in MDCT, which will again be period two of 2024. And as noted in that first box, period one of 2024 will be submitted using the PDF forms in July and August. Next slide, please. Now that I've covered a high level view of the timeline for the next year or so, I'll switch to focus on the content. So here's a look across the three reporting forms that we're talking about today, the operational protocol, the work plan, and the SAR. Across the three, reporting on transitions and program operations is occurring, but with different goals. So there's some animation here, so if we can advance one more. Thank you. Um, the focus of today is on the work plan where MFP recipients will project transition benchmarks and develop state or territory specific initiatives with measurable objectives and performance measures. But as you can see, the left column represents the connections around transitions with MFP recipients describing recruitment, enrollment, and transition processes in the OP and then projecting transition benchmarks in the work plan, and then finally reporting progress on recruitment, enrollment, and transitions in the SAR. And then similarly, that right-hand column illustrates connections around program operations, where the OP describes operational elements like housing and quality measurement, the work plan develops initiatives, objectives, and performance measures, and then progress on these are reported in the SAR. So some commonalities start to emerge where the action is described in the OP, project and develop in the work plan, and then report in the SAR. But again, today, the focus is on the work plan. Next slide, please. So with that set up, let's, let's jump to the next slide, please. Great. The main goals of this section are to revisit the purpose and requirements of the work plan, provide some guidance for developing the work plan, highlight additional work plan resources, and share some next steps before getting to the demo. Next slide. And I'll walk through some background content. Some of this will be revisiting information folks have already heard, so I'll focus on some key points on each slide. Next slide. So as I talked about in the connection slide earlier, the work plan provides an opportunity to document initiatives that support the state or territory's goals and objectives to rebalance long-term services and supports. It also enables states or territories and CMS to monitor these initiatives throughout the grant to determine what's going well and what might benefit from a course correction. And the resources listed here, the work plan template, the work plan help file, and the TA brief for using data are available to support work plan development at this time. If you don't have access to the Moodle site, um, which is where many resources are currently stored, please reach out to your CMS project officer. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So these two next slides pose a series of questions to help centralize some key information for you all. So the first question, what information do states and territories report in the work plan? The answer is two things, transition benchmarks and state or territory specific initiatives related to a rebalancing. There are more requirements when it comes to initiatives in terms of what needs to be reported, but I'll move into that detail a little bit later. Now, in terms of when do states report, we covered this with the timeline slide, but the initial work plan will be submitted in the fall for CMS review with the expectation that it will be finalized and approved by the end of the calendar year. And once the initial work plan is approved, MFP recipients will have an opportunity to update the work plan as needed. For example, as a new initiative begins or a current initiative is ending. In addition to keeping initiatives up to date, 
MFP recipients will need to continue to project um, transition benchmarks, and we anticipate that update process uh, will occur on a semi-annual basis. Next slide, please. So where um, and how MFP recipients will use the M MDCT application to submit the work plan. And if you need help or have questions about any reporting or submission requirements, you can reach out to these email addresses. The first is for technical questions about using the MDC application. So those can be sent to MDCT underscore help at, at cms.hhs.gov. And the second is for all other questions. And those can be directed to the CMS um, demo mailbox. Next slide, please. So as promised, I'll dive a little deeper into each section of the work plan. Up first is the transition benchmark section. And this is where you'll project the number of transitions by target group by quarter. You'll be asked for details on how your state or territory formulated those projected numbers. So this might include a description of the data sources you used, the time period of analysis, and methods you use to project the numbers. This is also a portion of the work plan where there might be an opportunity to engage your data quality analyst. The third field asks about details on strategies and approaches you plan to use to achieve these targets. This provides you a chance to describe how you'll meet the transition target, but it also provides a potential link to the next section if you have an initiative that supports transitions. Next slide, please. So there are many opportunities when it comes to thinking about initiatives for your MFP demonstration program. However, for the initial work plan, we've highlighted these two requirements for your planning purposes. In addition to the required initiative, MFP recipients must report all initiatives funded by MFP resources in the work plan, regardless of if the initiative is required or optional. So this is an important requirement to keep in mind as your internal planning conversations begin. MFP recipients are expected to engage in required initiatives and include them in the initial work plan. So those required initiatives are transitions and transition coordination services, housing related supports, and quality measurement and improvement. It's also required to have initiatives for self-direction or tribal initiatives if those are covered by your demonstration. Next slide, please. With one of the themes of today being connections between the reporting forms, I did wanna highlight that self-direction and tribal initiatives should be included in your operational protocols. So if one or both are described in your work plan, they should also be included in the OP and vice versa. Essentially, we'd expect to see consistency across the two forms. And now I will turn to initiative reporting details. Next slide, please. Thank you. You'll first be asked to describe your initiative. So that is, you'll provide the name, a description of what gap, challenge, opportunity the initiative will address, the topic, which goes back to the required initiative discussion, so think about transition and transition coordination services, housing related supports, et cetera. When you hear work plan topic, that's what we're talking about. And there will be a menu to choose from in MDCT, and the Word version of the work plan template also provides a list of potential topics for reference. Once you select a topic, you'll select all populations targeted by the initiative and the start and end date of the initiative. You'll be able to include initiatives that are both in progress and planned. Next slide, please. Then you'll turn to your evaluation plan and developing objectives. You'll need at least one objective per initiative. These objectives should be SMART, so that's meaning specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, relevant, and time-bound. You'll also describe the performance measures that you'll use to monitor progress, including any data sources or key deliverables. 
and you'll set targets for the performance measures, including any milestones or expected timeframes for those key deliverables. And finally, any additional details relevant for achieving targets that are not reported elsewhere can be captured. So for example, if you're dependent on an external partner for achieving the objective, you could note that in this field and note their roles. We have a couple of examples included in this presentation, so you can see some of how this might look in practice. And as I mentioned earlier, we have additional planned written resources, including example initiatives coming in early summer. Next slide, please. Um, then you'll select the relevant funding sources for the initiative and report the projected expenditures per by quarter. As noted here, actual ex quarterly expenditures will be reported in the SAR. Initiatives can be funded using one or more funding sources, including MFP cooperative agreement funds, for qualified HCBS demonstration services, supplemental services, administrative activities, and capacity building initiatives. Funding sources can also include state or territory equivalent funds attributable to the MFP enhanced match. Next slide, please. And then in terms of closing out an initiative, you'll enter the actual initiative end date. This reporting will begin when the end date of the initiative falls during the upcoming semi-annual report. So there's a little bit of sort of future sequencing there. Um, you'll also provide information here if an initiative is no longer sustained by MFP or equivalent funding. You'll be required to include why the initiative was discontinued or alternatively for initiatives that are or will be sustained, you'll include what alternate funding source will be used. Next slide, please. With this overview in mind, we have also put forward some planning considerations for you as you begin this work. Next slide. So when thinking about how to measure progress, consider using a variety of measures and measure targets for objectives. As many of you know, new initiatives take time to set up and to see progress in performance measurement. Therefore, you may want to consider a mix of short, medium, and long-term measures to track progress in establishing the initiative. Similarly, if the initiative is multi-year, it may be helpful to identify short-term milestones to measure and report while the broader initiative continues. Developing these short-term measures or milestones may help determine if you need to update operations or if any course corrections are needed. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, another consideration is whether you can use prior trends or experiences to develop reasonable targets. This may involve assessing feasibility and considering how much change is possible in a given time frame and the resources needed to engage the relevant stakeholders. And in connection with the previous slide, it's important to remember that process measures are generally easier to move forward than outcome measures, meaning it may be easier to move forward a measure that focuses on steps that should be followed to provide good care versus a measure that focuses on the health status of a patient resulting from the care. And also, as we heard Den talk a little bit about at the top of this call, and as was discussed in the January 2024 National Quarterly Call, recipients should start to consider the HCBS quality measure set when developing their work plans. For the initial implementation of the HCBS quality measure set, MFP recipients will be expected to report on a subset of the measures and develop a quality improvement plan related to two measures of their choice. Next slide, please. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have included a couple of object objectives in this presentation. Um, in the interest of time, I may not cover all three, um, but we'll see how fast I can get through these. Um, in terms of a quick orientation, um, all of these examples fall under the transitions and transition coordination service topics to illustrate some of the variety that's possible under the same initiative topic era, 
area and also to see if I can say that multiple times in the next five minutes. Um, with the first example, this is an objective that could be used to monitor progress toward that initiative. You'll see some of these steps in action during the demo, but before getting to this part, you would have completed an initiative name, the description, target populations, and start and end date. And so then this example picks up with the evaluation plan with the SMART objective, reduce time between MFP enrollment and transition into the community by 20% by 2027 by developing a new initiative around targeted care ma management in three of the largest nursing facilities. So then there are four performance measures listed here, with the first one being number of nursing facilities who were contacted about the, initi the initiative, and the last one being average time between nursing facility admission and MFP enrollment among participating nursing facilities. So you'll notice the first three are counts. This goes back to what we talked about earlier. New initiatives take time and in terms of seeing progress. So therefore, in this example, the MFP recipient has developed some short-term measures to track progress in addition to some longer-term measures. And similarly, as it may take time to um, for, MFP for the MFP recipient to see improvement in average times to transition, this may be a place where a short-term milestone may help determine if the recipient needs to update their operations. So for example, if the MFP recipient didn't have an established communication channel with the nursing facilities, they could add a short-term milestone to develop a clear communication channel between the MFP demonstration program and the nursing facilities um, to monitor whether they're successfully implementing. Next slide, please. So this next example focuses again on transition and transition coordination services. The objective centers on decreasing nursing facility readmission by 10% by conducting resident follow-up within 24 hours of nursing facility discharge. In this example, the performance measure the performance measures listed illustrate how you might leverage measures you already have in place or that other state agency parties may be using elsewhere. So here we have a NCIAD indicator, um, as well as LTSS4, and the percentage of nursing facilities discharges that resulted in readmission within 60 days. So these three measures represent a mix of data sources used in the HCBS quality measure set and illustrate how we might think about meeting those reporting requirements. So the N the N CIAD is a survey measure, MLTSS-4 relies on case management records, and then MLTSS-7 and 8 use claims and encounters. And this third measure is really a building block of the HCBS quality measures, LTSS-7 and 8. So again, uh, next slide, there is another example um, for you all to have as a reference. Um, if, uh, I will, in the interest of time, keep us moving and just share um, a final slide around some short-term next steps. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Great, so with the content I just shared, I did wanna leave you with some short-term next steps to consider. Begin to brainstorm initiatives and objectives for reporting with your teams. And as you saw with those example measures, data sources are critical. So these brainstorming sessions can include thinking about what monitoring systems are already in place, and considering how to leverage those data sources to monitor your objectives. This is another good opportunity to engage your data quality analysts if they are already in place. And then this is a team effort. So for objectives that will include other state agency parties or external partners, consider starting to engage those folks as early as possible. And then if you leave here with any two dates stuck in your head, I would vote for the following as you prepare your internal submission schedules. MDCT will open on May 1st, so it will be important to ensure that the relevant state or territory staff have access, but also start to familiarize themselves with the form and how it calls for data. 
And then the second date being September 3rd, which is a Tuesday, which is when the draft work plans are due to CMS. Okay, so with that, I'll say thanks for your time and turn things over to Natalie, our next presenter. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalie Carney, and I'm a product manager for CoForma. And I'm going to go ahead and give the live demo on the MFP application. Um, first, uh, we could go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so first we're going to talk about accessing the MDCT application. So there is a process that state users will need to go through in order to um, request a role and, and gain access to the system. And so in order to do that, uh, which it says here that this month CMS emailed um, the instructions out. So you should have that, but you can access this slideshow as well for that. Um, so basically, uh, the following slides will go over that, that high level overview of how to get your, your role requested. So we can go to the next slide. So if you uh, are new to IDM, then you'll go to the um, this website, mdctmfp.cms.gov. You'll select new user registration, which is a button on the IDM sign-in screen. And then you'll enter uh, the personal information that it requests. You'll enter a user ID and password, and then select a security question, and then you'll submit, and that will um, kick that over for an approver at CMS to approve you as uh, with that role. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So uh, this is where you'll start if you already um, are registered. So uh, home.idm.cms.gov, you'll select the role request option, and you'll actually go through and select Medicaid data collection tool, money follows the person. So you'll find that um, selection. Uh, and then from um, the drop down, you're going to select MFP state user role. Next slide. And then you'll just complete the remote identity proofing. Uh, and then complete that and submit your um, request for your MFP state user role. Once that's been approved, you'll be able to log into the MDCT MFP uh, application. Next slide. Okay, so uh, if it's okay, I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, everyone, uh, welcome to MDCT MFP portal. Once you log in, this is the landing screen that you'll um, be on. And so here, uh, just general information about the program. Uh, you can see that we have these different uh, access points, whether you're doing the work plan or you're gonna fill out the semi-annual progress report. There's user guides and help files that are linked for each of these, as well as this expandable dropdown that talks about the due dates. Um, and the MFP SAR has one as well. So to get us started, I'm going to enter the work plan. So you can see that here I am pretending to be a state representative um, from Puerto Rico who's going to enter their first work plan. So I will start MFP work plan, this button down here at the bottom. And the first time that you start a work plan, you'll get this modal, which is just gonna ask you a couple of questions so that we know where you're starting in the demonstration. So for these purposes, we'll select 2024 with the first reporting period, and I'm gonna select start new work plan. I'm, I apologize for interrupting, Natalie. Can everyone um, view the screenshots? I received a message that the screenshots are too small. Can we maybe try to enlarge it just a little bit of course. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Is that is that a little bit better? Yeah. A okay. little bigger. Yeah. A little bit bigger. Okay. How about that? That's great. Awesome. Thank you so much for pointing that out. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so once you've uh, started your work plan, you can see here that it's been created. It'll have uh, your state or territory, MFP work plan, the year, and then the reporting period. So it's really easy to tell which uh, report you're working with. Uh, so uh, we also have the due date, the edited date, um, whoever edited it last, and then the status of the report. Here you can see that we've not started the report which means that I'll go in and select edit here. And this is gonna drop me into the actual work plan. Let me scroll up and over a little bit. Uh, so, okay, so the first page is just the general information. Um, 
Christine went over a lot of this earlier, and so uh, feel free to read through it on your own time. We've also linked the user guide and help file inside the form as well for easy access. Um, so once you've gotten through your general information, you're going to select continue. So this is when this is where we'll talk about transition benchmark projections, which Christine touched on. So here we have uh, our core populations, older adults, individuals with physical disabilities, um, IDDD, and then individuals with mental health and substance use disorders. Uh, we also have the, uh, the option to add an additional target population. So this is where you could add any other target populations that you're tracking, such as if brain injury is one that you are tracking, you would enter that here, select save. And now you can see that brain injury is now on your list of target populations. So what we'll do now is go through each population and we're just going to essentially tell the system whether this po target population is applicable to your MFP demonstration. Um, so if we select no, then we would just sit save and that's all you would need to do for this particular target population. However, if this is applicable, then you would select yes. And this is where you get the projected quarters. So it's gonna project out three years worth of quarters for us to enter in these projected benchmarks. So just for this sake, I'm gonna say that we're gonna project that we have 10 transitions from, oops, sorry, from older adults per quarter. And obviously these numbers will reflect uh, your own MFP program. So then I'm gonna hit save. And if I scroll over, you can see that now there's this green check mark. This is how statusing will work in our system. If there's something that you still need to fill out, you'll see the red um, exclamation point. And if you filled out all of the required information, you'll see the check mark. So really quickly, I'm just gonna run through and say no to some of these populations um, just to kind of get us through. Oh, that's not scrolling for me, I'm sorry. Let me zoom out. Natalie, if you if you only enter your benchmarks year by year, would it accept it and give you a green check mark if you didn't do for 2025 and 2026? So what will happen is when you so you'll complete your your first one and you will need to fill out all of those quarters. And then as you continue, so let's say you're going back and you're going to report on period two for 2024, uh, what will happen is all of these will be copied, well, it will take off 2024 quarter one and quarter two, and then down here we'll have two additional quarters added, and those are the fields that you'll need to go in and fill out moving forward will just be the two additional quarters that get added uh, semi-annually as you fill this out. And that... Kayla, oh, no, go for it. I was just going to say, Kayla, in terms of um, the next um, prompts, in terms of the strategy, if you typically feel most confident in the next year, you could use that box to demonstrate, you know, document that you've assumed the same projections for, you know, these quarters from this date to that date. Mm -hmm. Yep. So for brain injury, I'm going to just um, add in some projections here and we're going to save and close that. And now you can see that I've entered in all of the necessary uh, fields for these benchmark projections per target population. I just wanna point out really quickly, the reason that there's this additional button here for brain injury is because this is a target population that the state added to the system, not one of the core populations that are pre-filled in. And so you do have the option to go back to this and edit the name of the target population, um, which would be this edit name button. Just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, so once you have uh, your benchmark projections in, then we'll continue. And this is where Christine was just talking about the strategy that you get to. So um, I'm just gonna hop over to my notes quickly and grab these answers that I have pre-populated. So um, you'll go ahead and just enter in the, the transition benchmark strategy. And there's two questions here. So one is, how did you formulate your projected numbers? Um, and of course, that should include you know, descriptions of the data sources, the time period, um, and the methods used. And then you have this second question, which is, provide additional detail on the strategies or approaches. And so um, we could enter in that additional information. And here you can just see some of the functionality where you can expand these text boxes if we have um, lots of text to enter. 
Uh, so once you have filled out your uh, strategy for your benchmarks, then I'm going to select continue. And now we're going to land on this state or territory specific initiatives instructions page. So this page is going to have a lot of text up front. It's going to give you a lot of information. It'll be a good resource for you as you go through the first couple of times uh, with the work plan. So here we just have some um, instructions, and then we also indicate that there are required initiatives versus optional initiatives, um, and those are listed here. If we continue to scroll down, um, it'll talk through some of the things Christine brought up, which is what you need to fill out for each initiative. And then at the very bottom here, we're going to ask you these questions because uh, we need to know if self-directed initiatives or tribal initiatives are applicable to your demonstration. For these purposes, I'm just going to say no to each of those and continue. So now we're at a point where we can start adding initiatives into the system. And so obviously what we'll talk about first is this big alert banner that comes up. Um, this is gonna tell you that you do not have an initiative for, um, or a topic, an initiative that goes with each of the required topics. And so you will need an initiative for transitions and transition coordination services, housing related supports, quality measurement and improvement. Now, if I had selected yes to self-direction or to tribal, then those would also be required to be satisfied by an initiative. So what I'll do is we'll start with um, the first uh, example that I have for an initiative. And this initiative name example is going to be Empowering Minds, Transforming Lives. And it's going to fall under Transitions and Transition Coordination Services. So as we talked about, these are all of the, um, basically all of your options for the work plan topics. However, we do have an option if you have a topic that's not listed here that you'd like to track, you would select other specify and you'd be able to name that topic here. For these purposes, we're gonna go with transitions and transition coordination services. So I'll save that. Now we can see that we have this um, here. It's not, uh, we have this, this alert here because we haven't completed the initiative. And so to do that, I'm going to select edit. And now we have these three areas that we've discussed on everything that you need to report on for your initiative. So to start, we're going to define the initiative. We'll select edit to get in there. And sorry, I'm going to hop back over to my notes just to grab some of these um, predetermined answers that I have. So you'll describe your initiative and you'll add in any key activities that you have. Um, and then what you'll do is you will uh, define those target populations that we talked about. So let's say that we are going to track older adults and brain injury for this initiative. Um, you can select as many as you are or as many as are applicable. And then we'll add in the start date. I'm just going to say that this started at the beginning of this year. And then I'll say that, no, there's not a projected end date. If you select yes for this, then you could just enter in whatever that projected end date is. And then we would have that data available in the system as well. I'm gonna save and return. So now that we have defined our initiative, we're gonna go through the evaluation plan. So here, um, and, and sorry, I didn't call this out before, but as you enter into each of these sections, you'll always be able to tell which initiative you are working on. It'll be at the top here pretty clear so that um, there's a little bit lack of confusion there. Okay, so we do have instructions here that um, you can drop down uh, and, and read if you'd like. It also gives you, sorry, it also gives you those um, objectives and how they'd like them to be structured. So here we'll add an objective. So the first objective that we're going to put into the system is going to be a qualitative objective. And so um, this one is going to be, we're going to complete an analysis of rural MFP participants and then identify potential differences in the number of transitions. So then we're going to describe the performance measures or indicators. And let me grab that. Um, so this just talks about the data analyst providing um, progress reports to leadership and then um, also providing a preliminary discussion of the results and then a final report of the conclusion of this initiative. And if we move down to the targets, here we'll just um, talk about how we anticipate the preliminary discussion of results will be available in March. 
of 2025 with the final report developed by May 2025. So just um, setting those dates and then calling out that there's no quantitative targets that we'll be using for this objective. Um, and the final report will include a list of data sources. So then we'll scroll down and it, this is the question, does the performance measure include quantitative targets? We've indica indicated that this is gonna be a qualitative objective. So I'm gonna select no here. And then there's this last question here that is just uh, regarding any additional information or details that you'd like to provide for your strategies. Um, so I just said that we'll share timelines with relevant stakeholders um, and make that clear in the report. So I'm gonna save that. Now you can see this is the objective that we've just added um, with those answers that you provided. And if you would like to edit it, it just simply pulls up that modal again and you can cancel or save. So I'm gonna add one more objective to this initiative and this will be the quantitative objective. So if you have um, numbers that you're tracking, this is how you'll do that. So we'll add in the objective. So this one, I'm gonna use one of the examples that Christine used in the slideshow earlier. So reducing the time between MFP enrollment and transitions into the community by 20% by 2027. And then again, we'll go through the performance measures. And so for this one, the performance measure is gonna be um, the number of nursing facilities who were contacted about this initiative. And the targets will be, So for the targets, um, we're going to document the quantitative targets below, and then I'm just calling out that the time frame is going to be three years. Um, this is really this field is really an opportunity to document more for the qualitative objective, and so um, you know I just added that in as a little a little hint text there because really with the quantitative data you're going to select yes, and then this is what we're looking for is for you to fill out these quarterly projected fields. Um, and so if we're looking at the number of nursing facilities who were contacted and you're setting these goals, let's just say that the goal is to contact uh, 10 nursing facilities per quarter. Um, and we're gonna enter that here. And of course, these numbers will reflect your own MFP demonstration. Um, and then this final question again, so any additional details um, that we'd like to include. And so here, I'm just gonna add in a little blurb that our plan is to monitor uh, this semi-annually and then make adjustments to the plan um, if we run into staffing constraints. So just calling out that staffing might be an issue for this program. And so that might affect the number of nursing facilities that we can contact per quarter. I'm gonna save this. And here you can see this uh, new objective card. We've entered both of them. This one will show you exactly what your uh, quantitative targets are for the next three years. And you'll be able to, again, edit that here um, or just view it in this card format on this page. All right, we're gonna continue. We're almost done with this initiative. So the last thing that we'll fill out here is the funding source or sources, depending on your program. So I'll add a funding source here. Um, like it's the same pattern that we've had before where you'll have some options that are predetermined that you can choose from. Uh, and then if there's a different one that you'd like to enter, you could collect or select other, and then you would specify that here. For this purpose, I'm just gonna select the MFP cooperative agreement funds. And um, let's say that our projected expenditures are uh, 25, not thousand, hundred uh, per quarter. So we'll put this in here. Oops. And then we'll save that. So then it'll, it's the same card format as the objectives. You'll see what the funding source is and these projected quarterly expenditures uh, for the next three years. Uh, you can add additional funding sources. Again, it just depends on your own program. So then we'll save and return. Uh, Christine mentioned this initiative closeout. This will be, this is not accessible on your first work plan uh, because you do have to have an approved initiative to have it be closed out. And so this will become available when you start your second work plan. Uh, and all it will be, it's a very clear um, form that just has you answer a question about why it's closing out and then you enter the closeout date. Um, I'm gonna, oops, sorry. I don't know what that was. 
Oh, now my screen. This is like classic Zoom where it's covering the thing. Okay, sorry about that. Um, all right, so then we're back to the initiative screen. And here you can see I still have this alert banner because the only one that I have satisfied is this transitions and transition coordination services. And so if you'll bear with me for one minute, I'm just going to do a really quick um, data entry to show you that that alert banner will go away once those are satisfied. So now I have in um, my three uh, initiatives and really quickly, again, you're going to have to bear with me because I'm just going to have to enter in some information quickly to show you what uh, will happen when you're ready to submit the work plan. Um, and I can actually show you why I'm doing it this way. So if I go to review and submit, this is the page that will kind of show you the status of your report. So here you can see that I'm not eligible to submit this work plan yet because there's an error here because I have not finished filling out this section. And so if I just click edit from that review and submit page, I can come back here and I can see, okay, I have two more initiatives that I need to fill out. Um, I'll add an objective for this. Again, this is just fake data to show you how the system works. Um, we'll return and add a funding source. Okay, and we're gonna do this one more time, y'all. So thank you for bearing with me. Just on this last one, define initiative, um, select the population, turn the start date. Okay. We're almost there. And funding sources. Okay. So once I do this, Perfect. We're going to return to all initiatives. Now you can see that all of these have these green check boxes, which tells me that I have filled out all of the uh, required information. I'm going to go to review and submit. Quick check here tells me that I have completed everything that I need to. The submit work plan button is now active and I'm going to submit. It's going to say, are you sure that you're ready? You're going to say yes. And now it tells you that your uh, work plan has been successfully submitted. Um, Kim is going to, she's on this call, she's going to pretend to be my CMS admin for me. And so she's going to go in and, to her side and she'll be able, the admin will be able to review the work plan and then they will um, either approve it or send it back for edits. Um, and so I'm going to leave this form. Oh, that was fast. So you can see here, um, I came back to my dashboard and my status of my work plan has changed to approved. So it would have said submitted had I come back here right after I submitted it. Um, and now it's approved. And when it becomes approved, you get into a view only state where you can view all of the data that you entered, but you won't be able to change anything. So that is the work plan. I know that we are running pretty low on time. And so what I'm gonna do is just show you really quickly, once you have an approved work plan, how you would uh, start a SAR. So you'd come back to your portal and you would enter the SAR online. It's gonna even set it. You saw that there was a warning banner that said you had to have an approved work plan. The system then checked and saw that that was an approved work plan. So I'm gonna add a new SAR submission. So here it's already gonna pre-fill out all of the, um, like the associated work plan, the state or territory, the reporting period. Um, and then it's gonna ask if this is your final SAR for your MFP demonstration. I'm gonna say no. And then there's also the target populations that are coming over um, the four plus the one that was added into the work plan. So I'm gonna save that. Okay. So here is the work plan. Um, I'm going to go into edit just like I, or I'm sorry, this is the SAR. I'm going to go into edit just like I would have in the work plan. And really quickly, I'm just going to go through um, what the SAR looks like. So first, you're going to fill out some general information about your organization, your AOR, your project director, and your CMS project officer. 
Um, and then you're going to get into recruitment, enrollment, and transitions. Here you can see that you only have to fill out fields for the uh, target populations that you indicated were applicable in the work plan, which is why we're only going to see number of older adults and brain injury here, because that's what I said was applicable in my work plan. So we will go through each page of the recruitment, enrollment, and tra transitions where you'll report on the different uh, quarters for the reporting period. Um, and you can see here, um, consent form, the number of uh, participants who signed the consent form, the number of transitions in the reporting period, it's just broken out into these different sections. And then once you get through that, then you're going to start reporting back on the initiatives that you entered into your work plan. So here we can see empowering minds, transforming lives. This is the one that we went through. And I'm going to click click edit. Sorry. Um, here we're going to go through our objectives progress. So if I select edit here, then I can go in and I can report progress on this qualitative objective. So I could just say um, I could provide data on the performance measure or indicators used and just give a blurb on that. And then I'm gonna say, uh, yes, that the, the targets were met. If I selected no for this, it would allow me to add in additional information as to why the targets were not met for this objective. And then here you can see that this is our second one that is the quantitative. And you can see that we're reporting on 2024 quarter one and quarter two. And when I open this up, well, again, you'll provide a little bit of information here, and then you'll add in the actual value for these target values. And then again, was it met? Yes or no? And you'll be able to provide additional information if it's no. The last thing that I'll show you uh, in the SAR is this um, is the funding sources. So here you have the what we selected in the work plan, the MFP Cooperative Agreement Funds. And then you can see that I projected 2,500. You'd be end, able to enter in what the actual spending was for these quarters. Uh, and then taking into account the lag time for reporting expenditures, is the state or territory on track to fully expend funds within the projected timeframe for this initiative? And we have the same um, thing here, where if you say no, you can provide more information. Um, I'm gonna to return to the dashboard and just show you quickly, uh, you'll have some organization and administration questions to answer, additional achievements that you can enter. And then we have the same format for review and submit where you can see that obviously I have a lot of work to do in my SAR, um, but I could easily navigate throughout the form where I see the errors and where I need to um, go back in and provide more information. So that was a very fast um, demo of what the MFP demonstration will look like in MDCT. Um, I will say just a quick shout out to our help desk team. They are phenomenal. And so as we go through this and as you start, um, I would just really encourage you to reach out with any questions that you have to them. They are, um, we're really lucky to have them. They're a phenomenal help desk team. So thank you so much for allowing me to present. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you, Coforma team. Also, thank you, Mathematica team. We have about nine minutes for q and I uh, just want to uh, quickly note that I am capturing uh, the questions that are coming in in the chat. Um, it looks like some of the Coforma team have taken the liberty of uh, answering um, some of the questions that came in through the chat. So if you look through the chat, there are some answers there. So again, nine minutes left. If you would like to unmute yourself and ask a question, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, I will uh, send out a Q&A document um, shortly. Uh, this is Aubrey in Kansas. <clears throat> I was just inquiring as to what role would I select in the myself and the IDM self-service tool? Yeah, the answer is it's just in the chat. Uh, I'm not seeing that. It says state oh, user role. Right. Yep, she just put it there. MP state. Okay, MCT, MFP state user role. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and this one note, the roles will not be approved until the official launch. So uh, that's also noted in the chat as well. And sorry, Alicia, did you say you're compiling this and you're gonna send it out? 
Yeah. So you have to hunt and peck through the chat for all that. You have to hunt and peck. I am uh, collecting all the questions and answers that Coforma is responding to. Are there any more questions? Okay. Well, having heard none, um, again, I am capturing- I have a quick one. Sure. I have one. Sorry. So if we request an extension on a due date, will that be reflected in the website as well? I'm not sure that there's a the ability to reflect it in the site. Um, someone from Coforma can answer that, but if you work with your project officer and just make them aware that you're requesting an extension, I'm sure that would be fine. Um, depending on the circumstance, but I'm not sure that there is a way to capture that in the actual um, MDCT system. Yeah, um, we yeah, that's correct. So sorry, this is David Coger. I think Natalie got kicked out of the Zoom by accident. Um, yeah, so there's not going to be an indicator within the system itself. The due date won't block you from being able to continue working on it. Um, but yeah, to Alicia's point, um, the communication with your representative just to uh, confirm that um, extension would be the step that you need to take there. Thank you, David. Okay, we have six minutes left. Also want to note in the chat that there is still time to uh, provide additional feedback regarding the uh, MFP intensive during the ACBS conference, the Moodle, Moodle information, the link is uh, in the chat um, and you can still um, provide information if you would like to. Um, we have the slide here uh, for Q&A. If there are any additional questions that come in after we've uh, ended today's session, you can please direct your questions to the MFP demo mailbox. I was I was just going to ask that once our work plan is approved, um, provided everything goes well, is this how we're going to do rebalancing initiatives then? Is it going to be entered into the work plan and then that's how we'll seek approval? At this time, it's just the work plan, um, how it ends are, but we are considering, you know, adding additional uh, work to the MD MDCT system, but rebalancing proposals will still be in the same process. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? We have five minutes left. So um, I just want to jump in. This is Todd Wilson from CMS. Um, Kayla, I think what we're envisioning here is that, you know, any initiatives that you would have, you'd be able to identify the funding source. So if the funding source is only state funds and you consider that a rebalancing initiative, then you would not need to do a separate process to submit that. So, you know, we believe that this system is designed in a way that will, um, you know, cover your rebalancing request as well. For ongoing, but for new ones, Todd, like say we have a new one, we would still submit that to our project officers via email. But I was just wondering, like, in the future, if this is launched, if that would be where we submit it so that, again, we're not all just focused on our email and it's all in one spot. You know what I mean? Like, so if I fell off the face of the earth today and somebody's like trying to find an email from God knows when, they could just go to the website and say, oh, well, here's where it is. Here's when she submitted it. Right. So there's a separate indicator yeah. for the balancing in the system. Okay. That's what you're asking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like that once it's all up and running, that this is going to be the tool to make those requests and, and that mm -hmm. type of thing. Yeah. Yes. And it will be up and running soon. Very, very soon. <laughs> and then Allie, I'm not sure you saw that, but North Dakota be willing to be a pilot project state for your one-on-one -on -one mentorship or anything that you want to offer to us, we'd be open to it. Uh, what a huge compliment after a live demo. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> reach out. We'll set something up. Okay. Um, so we have three minutes left. Um, 
If you are experiencing issues logging into the Moodle, please email the M MFP demo mailbox um, if you still like to add some information. Any other questions? Well, again, we'd like to thank our partners at uh, Mathematica and Coforma, and we'd like to thank you all for joining today's call. We hope that it was uh, valuable, and we will talk to you all soon. In the meantime, stay safe. Thank you.